Hmm, okay. Hey, another pandemic game. I think we haven't seen another hundred of these already. Ah oh, well, like I say, they're pretty decent games. So what are we doing now? Rising Tide, eh? Now we're heading towards the Netherlands and the Dutch. Okay, cool. I like the area, I want to see it more. Sounds like a cool game. Matt Leacock and Jerome Duman? Is that how you pronounce it? Why is that name familiar? Hang on. Let me just check on that. No. No, it can't be. No, 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 it, no, 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 no. Hello and welcome to another Broken Meeple review. Yes, we'll um, gloss over that first rant. Shall we say the designer of this game, you know, fair enough. <laughs> I'm sure he's a lovely bloke, but the publisher he's associated with, let's just say they've not been on my best of terms. I mean, certain games that they mention, I won't go into too much detail, have left me maybe just a little bit less than happy at times, you know, nothing substantial, nothing crazy, just maybe not quite as joyful as I could be. But we're going to look over that, okay? Because this is another addition to the ever-growing, never-ending Pandemic franchise. What have we had now? Two Legacy games, Pandemic, I think that had three expansions with it, On the Brink, In the Lab, and that weird, um, oh, can't remember the other one, it was, a. Uh, it was like it had animals and things like that. I mean, nobody really actually bought that one, I don't think. It wasn't that popular an expansion. We've had the Dice version, you know, Pandemic the Cure. Now we have Pandemic Iberia. That's actually the one I have on my shelf. You know, I do like that one. And now we've got Rising Tide, another one that they put in this survival series, as they're calling it. Basically, how many more reasons can we chuck Pandemic out at the viewing public? <laughs> Sounds like I'm being harsh. Nah, honestly, Pandemic is a fantastic co-op game, and definitely one that deserves credit for getting a lot of people into the hobby who are brand new to games. It's just so accessible, it just works. It's one of those streamlined Euro games, that the uh, co-op games even, that just seems to work and deserves every bit of credit it could get. But can we, like, can we take it easy now? This is starting to get ridiculous. Anyway, Pandemic Rising Tide now has us going to the Netherlands and helping out the Dutch with their flood problem. It's based on historical events. Now, I have very little knowledge about history. You know, as you know from my other reviews of games, I don't pay attention to history. But basically, the way I see it, the Netherlands is getting flooded. You gotta save them. You know, you don't really need to know about the history. Just know that is the theme of the game and you're good. And it definitely is in the Netherlands. Not Norway. As I put in my first picture when I decided to uh, post a picture of this game, I was a little bit flagging at the time. I was somewhat, uh, you know, not entirely with it. And I, for some reason, put Norway instead of the Netherlands at first. I corrected myself eventually. But yeah, not Norway, Netherlands. So in this... It's very much like a normal pandemic game. You've got your rolls, you've got your action pawns, you have four actions a turn, you draw two cards, you know, bad stuff happens, and then you rinse and repeat. And like before, you were building research stations, now you're building four, you know, like gigantic water pumps slash dams, you know, like four construction sites. And you do this, and you win the game. Of course, if you let all the flood cubes onto the board, then you lose. And generally that happens more often than not, actually. We'll get onto that later. Once you've got used to the base game, though, which, you know, like I say, pretty much like every other pandemic out there, then you can throw in a nice little extra variant which mixes up the objective. So it's not just about building the four, you know, dams and construction sites. You might have to build some, and you can still build them, 
but you might also have to get a certain amount of population in various places. You might have to, you know, clear out certain areas of flood entirely, you know. You can shuffle these cards, they have the objectives on them, you mix and match, I think you draw anywhere between four to six depending on the difficulty level, and you go with that. It's a pretty sweet variant and one that I would probably throw into most games of this to be honest, just to chop and change things up a bit. But in terms of what it looks like, this is, well, I know Beauty in the Eye of the Beholder and this doesn't look too bad. And I have to admit, I do wonder whether it's his influence, <laughs> you know, you know what the publisher games are like. But this is probably the worst looking pandemic game I've seen. Not to say it's ugly and horrible, but it's quite muted. You know, you can tell the different colours, but they're very dark colours. It's like the whole setting is meant to look quite miserable and gloomy. Maybe that's the theme they were going for, you know, dark stormy weather, therefore, you know, everything does look a bit gloomy and that. But yeah, this one doesn't jump out of the table quite as much as, say, Pandemic Iberia, for example, or even pretty much the normal Pandemic when you've got, like, various expansions in there. So this one isn't the best-looking one for me, but, you know, it's not a massive deal. Everything else is pretty well produced, though. I mean, the board is decent quality. You've got translucent blue cubes for the Flood. You've got, you know, the roll cards, decent card quality. You've got big, thick, chunky markers for the uh, construction sites, not just a tiny little Monopoly house. And, like I say, generally the production quality of this is pretty sound. You've got to give it credit for that. How's it play out like a, compared to normal Pandemic? Well, pretty much the same. You've got one or two slight tweaks on the rules for getting your, you know, maneuverability around the map, but... Rather than going across like different lines, you know, to show sea routes, you're basically all in different regions around the Netherlands and you can chop and change from like one region to the next. You can build ports in order to move yourself around a bit quicker. You can build pumps, which are, you know, water pump stations, which allow you to sort of mitigate the flood. And of course, you've got the main construction sites that you're doing, but other than, and also dikes where you are blocking up certain regions from each other with basically flood blocking. Now, the main difference that I find with this game is the way the flood works. We've been used to Pandemic where it's all about infection cubes. You put out three cubes, they outbreak, and then they spread to the neighboring areas, and that's about it. Well, here it's a little bit different, and in a good way, actually. Because you still have to draw infection, well, I was saying infection, it's like normal pandemic. You still have to draw the two, like, cards off the top of the, I don't know what to really call it, but basically off the flood deck, I'll call it. And you draw the two cards and it gives you the region names and you have to put the cubes on and do things as you would in a normal pandemic game. But the cool thing with this is that it has a specific rule where, depending on how many flood cubes you have in a region, if there's an exposed region next to you, then, depending on the number, flood cubes appear in there. So you don't need an actual outbreak to happen. I mean, that can still happen. You can still have a massive flood rush. But even if you just had a couple of cubes in one region, you could get a cube in the next one. So it spreads very quickly. Because effectively, it's simulating the water flow. As soon as you've, when you've got water blocked up, uh, you know, under the, you know, by the coastline or in certain regions with those dikes, all is well. But as soon as a dike gets removed, and that's effectively what the flood deck cards do. Normally you were removing, uh, you know, cubes and stuff like that. Now you're removing the dikes. But as soon as those dikes get removed, you have to check whether the water would flow from one region into the next, you know, just by itself. And if they're exposed, water passes in, more cubes on the board. Run out of flood cubes, and that's another way to lose. But I find that really cool in a thematic sense, because that's what would happen. You know, if, if you had exposed areas, then the flood would just carry on. You know, what's the, you know, Doctor Who's favourite line? You know, water always wins. It does, yeah, it's very difficult to hold it back. But it also does really ramp up the difficulty level. I've played Pandemic Legacy 1 and 2 and the normal Pandemic with expansions and Iberia. This is on par with, I'd say, normal Pandemic with In The Lab. Because In The Lab was quite a tough expansion to beat when you had all those moving parts and everything else. This is, I think, harder, if not on par with that. And I know some people have got different ideas about what they class as hard or not. But this is definitely a tough Pandemic. And that's before you up the difficulty level or change and you know, chop and change the objectives. I'm just talking introductory and standard mode in this is pretty tough, particularly if you're using certain roles over others. 
I don't want to leave my, you know, my base without the carpenter in this. You know, she, he can build dikes when you're in flooded areas, which normally you can't. That is super useful. And he can also build pumping stations for free. You don't have to get rid of cards. And those two things together just make him such a perfect role for my style of play. So I never want to leave the gate without him. But it certainly makes this one harder. This is definitely one to think about if you need a challenge in Pandemic. You thought like maybe others were getting too easy, you wanted something a little bit tougher, then go with it. Another issue I had with the component quality in this though is the way the map looks. The dikes are put on these little etched out spaces. You can see where they gotta go, but you're looking at regions that are shaped all, you know, wiggly wobbly lines, and the dikes are laid out on them in straight lines. It looks a bit weird when you've got the dikes on them, like it's hard to tell where a region ends and starts because you're putting a straight piece on a wiggly line. It's kind of odd and it does make the map look a bit busy at times. Add to this the fact that you're in the Netherlands. Now I'm not saying anything against like the Dutch language or anything, but every region in this is named after the proper meaning of the Dutch word behind it. So you're not just simply going Spain, France, Germany, which are names you recognize. These are all the Dutch names and their spelling, pronunciation of them. I know nothing about Dutch geography. You know, I've been to Amsterdam, that's it. That is literally my knowledge of the Netherlands. And yet you have all these names in here, which does make life a bit tricky when you're trying to locate anything on the map. Even when you draw the cards and they've got like a very zoomed in picture of what it is you're trying to look at, you're still looking at the name going, I have no idea what that is, where is it on the board? And you're trying to pick it out out of a lot of words that actually sound and look quite similar. So the board gets very busy, it's a bit harder to work with, it's not quite as, I'm not saying intuitive, but it's not quite as easy flowing to look at and maneuver around as maybe other pandemics have been with, you know, I would dare say more widely known areas and countries and regions. You know, if you, I mean, if you're from the Netherlands, you know anything about the Dutch, you'll recognize all these names anyway. But if you're, if you know, like me, you know nothing about the Netherlands, you're probably going to have that little bit of an issue when you're trying to work out all these names on the board. But it's a minor niggle. It's not a big deal. You know, the card maps are there. They show you where it is on the region and eventually you will get used to the board and you've still got everything color coded by region. Uh, one thing I do quite like is the the station mark. Say station, the the like the dam markers, the ones you got built to win. Normally, in the previous pandemics, you built four stations and you won, and that was about it. Every time you cured a disease, that was it. You cured a disease, great. You had a slight benefit, but that was about it. Here, each one of them gives you a special bonus. One allows you to build loads of dikes. One allows you to clear a bunch of cubes. One allows you to block off an entire section. You know, and so on. And even when you use the variant, which we'll get onto later, you can still build them, you know, and building each one can become a little bit more strategic. They're fixed, so you have to go to the actual location. Again, this is a tougher pandemic, but once you build them, you might time it so that you can get the most out of that extra benefit. It's a cool little feature, and I wish they had that in previous pandemics. I know they, well, actually, I'm not going to spoil anything, but, you know, it would be nice to see it in more pandemics going forward. It was a nice little addition. The variant is where you shuffle together a bunch of objectives and you deal them out randomly at the start and that dictates your winning conditions. So you can still build those sites, but you might not have to build all four now. You might only have to build one or two. And instead you might have to keep a certain area completely free of cubes. You might have to get an area filled up with dikes, you know, uh, you know sealed off. Or there's a little mini population variant, which is that you have to get, it's kind of weird and a little bit fiddly. You have to get these population cubes into a certain area and make certain that they don't get flooded over, otherwise they die off and that's another way to lose the game. It's neat, but eh, I don't know, I, I can take it or leave it. I'm not a fan of the population uh, like cubes and stuff like that. I think it's like one step too far. You've already got enough to deal with. It's tough enough as it is. Do you need to throw that in? But I do like being able to chop and change the, you need to control certain areas, keep them out of way, and those sites. That's what I like to use this variant for. Other than that, there's not much else to say. The game is your typical run-of-the-mill pandemic game, except now you have a water theme instead of a hospital theme, and it's certainly a lot more challenging, even if the whole sort of board and everything looks a bit muted and bland compared to other pandemics. So overall, I did enjoy it. 
I found it probably a bit too tough for a pandemic game. I mean, to certainly I don't think you should get this if you want to show it to new players. I think Pandemic Iberia did a pretty good job of that, you know, as a standalone one. Failing that, just get the original Pandemic. It's good for what it is. You know, it is a perfect way to introduce people to the hobby. I would say this is a next step Pandemic. I wouldn't want to show a new player this. It might just be a little bit too tough for them. A little bit too like, oh my god, we are getting destroyed type sort of game. I mean, could be wrong. Maybe they're from the Netherlands. Maybe they like the whole flood theme rather than the infection theme. I certainly do like the way that the water acts in this one where it floods from one region to the other. So you can have these massive cascade effects where something just gets removed and suddenly it causes a complete flow of water across your land that you weren't expecting or you didn't plan well enough for. You know, that sort of thing I like and I would like to see that maybe used in another pandemic setting. And it's certainly the one thing that elevated this one to a decent level for me. But yeah, I'm kind of mute on it. And it's got nothing to do with the whole, you know, designer thing. You can tell his fingerprints on this game, probably by the, you know, the color scheme and that. And obviously, because obviously he's Dutch, therefore it makes sense to have a Dutch designer work on a Dutch Netherlands game. So I say I enjoyed it, but I'm probably only gonna go as high as a six for me personally. I think it's okay. But I've got Pandemic Iberia, and I still think that's the superior one of the survival series so far. The legacy games are kind of a separate deal, so I'm not really including those. And I would certainly play Iberia over the original Pandemic now, even with the expansions included. So this is probably one of my least favourite of the range, but it's not to say I think it's bad, I think it's still decent. If you want the Netherlands Flood theme, go for it. If you want the, a very challenging Pandemic, then go for it. You know, if you want the ability to chop and change objectives, then go for it, because that hasn't happened in the normal standalone pandemics yet. So, yeah, all in all, decent enough. Probably not suited to me, really, but, you know, I, I probably won't hang on to this one. I'm going to keep Iberia, and, like I say, hopefully somebody else will enjoy it. So, that's it for me. I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple review. Hopefully my house has not been washed away by the time I do this, because it it's been somewhat wet lately, I must admit. So, whether you are flooded away into the sea, never to be seen again, it was only a game, we'll find you eventually. See you soon guys, take care.